aesthetic value of this uh, uh, building. Uh, the problem with concrete is not only the deterioration of reinforcement and the structural Uh, 50 years ago, is the disrespect uh, I had not time to explain this problem of the chiaroscuro. We try to perform very accurate flutes and uh, trying to investigate, to uh, design these flutes, we found that some tolerances of uh, tenths of millimeters have a very serious effect in the overall appearance of, of the building. A lot of researchers, of architects, of archaeologists had wrote about, about this thing, the, what uh, Penro said, that it is unique in Athens, in Attica, the, uh, the sunlight, which we have not in uh, London said Penrose, and even if, even if we succeeded to construct forms like the Athenian forms, we could, we could not have the same result because we have not the light here in, in London, uh, wrote Penrose. So, trying to, as Professor Torcello said, try to uh, respect the original values of, uh, of the monument, you learn more. Uh, you make attempts that maybe they will be reformed uh, afterwards from researchers after us and this is the, this is the uh, validity of uh, reversibility. This is another philosophical aspect that always we have to perform reversible action, reversible uh, restoration. But even this reversibility, it's very clear that practically, technically, is an optimum, is a, a general idea. Practically, you, can, you could never uh, achieve a real uh, reversibility. So, all this philosophical uh, discussion is reasonable, but uh, in many cases, unfortunately, we have to, to, to act, we have to, to make praxis, and I think that a technical, uh, a technical quality in interventions and discussions like that, I, need, I, I mean what uh, uh, nowadays is more easy than in the past to discuss together the experts between them and to have uh, uh, this uh, discussion and uh, in many cases this debate about to do or not to do this thing is uh, a, base, a basic uh, factor, is a basic advantage of nowadays to avoid the mistakes of the past. Technology and uh, scientific uh, discussion. And from this point of view, thanks once again for your... Uh... Any other? Okay, if there are no more questions or no more contributions, let's say that we interrupt here. Um, our program says that we meet again at three o'clock for the afternoon sessions. Um, there is lunch, of course, upstairs at the AA restaurant, and we will um, meet again at three. Thank you very much of uh, our conference and uh, I hope it's going to be as interesting as this morning uh, all the speeches were the title or the theme if you like of this uh, session is restoration and simulacra uh, which already indicates uh, uh, certain uh, interest in uh, discussing and debating the issue of restoration and of course the issue of what happens when things are restored vis-a-vis -vis what kind of uh, actual image we have at the end in contemporary culture, I suppose, uh, which is the contemporary culture, as you know very well, uh, based on the theatralization uh, of uh, our contemporary life. I, I won't expand uh, any more on that. Perhaps we can discuss it at the end. 
Now, we, we should start, as we should start this morning with uh, Mrs. Harris Kaligas, who is an architect, a Greek architect and town planner, but as you probably uh, know already uh, from Mr. Economou, both uh, Mr. and Mrs. Kaligas, they have to be in Malvasia, which is this uh, very interesting and very beautiful uh, uh, walled city in uh, uh, Peloponnese. So she's not here with us. Of course, we have her paper, and uh, Mrs. Evgenia Richardson, who is actually an archaeologist, and also she's the director of the Foundation for Hellenic Culture in London. She's, she's going to be so candid and read it, uh, the text for us. So please, Mrs. Richardson. Her title is Behind Reflections. About 1962, when the rock of Monemvasia, with its still inhabited medieval walled city, was proclaimed a protected monument, already most of its population have moved elsewhere. Some permanent inhabitants remained, a few shops, and a kind of social life. The fact that Monemvasia never stopped being inhabited secured not only its long life, but also the continuity of its architecture. Materials, types, and forms were survivals of very ancient predecessors. Because of the fact that the town, as most Greek towns, was drained of its inhabitants after World War II, building activity was almost non-existent. Only minimal interventions on existing constructions have taken place. In the early 60s, tourism started to develop, as in other cases of all towns in Greece. First came the efforts of the National Tourist Organization. They developed the project of a new Xenia Hotel covering a large area of the old city, which would be stripped of its old remains, as was the case with Nafplion. Normally, the Xenia hotels built in modern style covered important parts of the old towns. There was a tendency to decorate them with woven blankets and bags, copper utensils, and other objects which had a reference to tradition between inverted commas. The case of these hotels expresses very vividly the perception of conservation and management of historic sites of the majority of our colleagues during the 60s and 70s. Monemvasia was lucky enough not to suffer this fate. The Xenia was avoided. They developed instead a remarkable interest for buying property by Athenians and foreigners. These people found themselves owners of houses which had gone through a gradual process of decay and an important history behind them. Two tendencies were formed. The first was expressed mostly by people who chose to buy houses in good condition, sometimes with the furniture and equipment. The new owners normally attempted minimal interventions using local workforce, a tiny toilet, the painting of the windows, some slight rearrangement of the rooms. Whatever was done was accommodated in what pre-existed not only as a shell, but what is more important, as a conception of space and as a way of life, the life that was led by the previous Monevasiot's owners. Thus the life of the new owners was almost suffocatingly restricted to the kind of life the Monevasiot society led in the first half of the 20th century. Certainly, it had nothing to do with Monevasi's early past a history of about 14 centuries. What is notable is a certain lack of curiosity about what elements of this earlier history might have been incorporated in the houses acquired. All this touches upon important aspects of restoration and conservation, but, it, but is beyond the specific theme of the symposium. On the contrary, the second tendency is nearer to our theme. It was expressed by a different group of people, who wanted to reestablish the glory of Byzantium. They bought houses more or less ruined, which were restored with a contractor, an important Athenian lady, brought with her, 
who then remained permanently on the spot. He was totally untrained, his only experience having been work in the outskirts of Athens in modern second-rate constructions with concrete and bricks. He did not know much about building with stone, let alone making vaults, carved casements for doors and windows, wooden roofs, or other constructions as those found in Monenvasia, which need specialized masons and craftsmen. His collaboration with the new owners produced a totally new style of interventions, which became dominant in the Monenvasia for the following five years. It has to be noted that they were accepted and supported by the authorities, in this case, the archaeologist of the Greek archaeological service. In remodeling the ruined houses, the interested parties seem to have tried to follow an idealized prototype, the model of a Byzantine house. The reasoning was that Monenvasis' glorious past was Byzantine, and consequently the architecture had to be connected with Byzantium. This meant that whatever did not fit their interpretation of Byzantine had to be changed. The main feature of this imagined model was large arched openings towards the view. In the place of the extended surfaces of stone walls with relatively reduced surfaces of openings of usual small dimensions, which were only occasionally arched. The practice that became dominant was to pull down the old walls on which the paths could be read and with them various other elements which had been incorporated. The next step was to stack the accumulated rubble on top of the uh, older remains. This is a method which has been used always in the past, but it's the opposite of what is necessary in Monenvasia now for the understanding and interpretation of the remains. Building on top of the rubble followed. The deliberate attempt to imitate certain styles in stone wall building was combined with ignorance and clumsiness which accentuated the false appearance. The concrete arches which were erected towards the view were traced with curves which never existed in Monevasia and had to be voussoirs passed, sorry, pasted, glued onto the concrete, pointing towards the wrong directions. The openings of the arches were shut by glass panes with iron decorations, among which most prominent the iron double-headed eagles, the symbol of Byzantium. <laughs> Windows with carved lintels and casements were pillaged from other houses and positioned pell-mell in the building to complete the necessary openings. Pink cement covered the facades so as to match the color of the rock. Crenellations for dwarfs crowned the new concrete terraces. Old houses in Monenvasia did indeed have terraces, formed always on top of vaults and their volumes, their situation in relation with the main house, the heights, the heights and other elements follow strict rules. The new ones were placed on top of reinforced concrete slabs and followed new independent rules. Wooden roofs and other wooden constructions, staircases, tiles, gutters, mortars, plasters, floors, all reflected an imaginary reality which have never existed. Everybody, however, believed that restoration was taking place and everybody was fond and proud of what was happening. This description is not exaggerated in the least. This is how it happened, and I do not attempt to ridicule the practices of the 60s, but to try to understand the process which turns good intentions into false results. It is clear in the case of Monenvasia that the continuity of life of the, and of the relevant social conditions, combined with a certain decay after the glorious Byzantine past, secured the preservation of traditions, especially the building traditions, which has secured until recently, not strictly speaking restoration, but conservation, natural and successful. It is also clear that as soon as this process stopped to work, automatically what was imposed the result was the ridiculing of the extremely valuable architectural heritage of Monenvasia. There are some other not so pronounced examples produced more recently in Monenvasia where imposed restoration disfigured old buildings and led to false results. 
An example of this sort is Kelia, an old pilgrim, pli, pri, sorry, pilgrim's guest house, which was very appropriately turned into a hotel, between parentheses, by the National Tourist Organization, exclamation mark. In this case, in which the use seems to fit very well with the original purpose of the building, the sort of interventions that took place are not justified. It is a simplified neoclassical building of the late 19th century. The facade was originally covered with a bright pink plaster surrounded by bands of lighter color. The windows did not have the usual porous casements, but had white plaster instead. The wooden shutters were painted bright blue. There was a marble and iron balcony and a large cast iron lighting fixture for the street. The building was a testimony of the evolution of architecture in Monevasia. The simplified neoclassical ideas which were introduced deserved to be protected. However, the archeological authorities imposed changes which illustrate how they understand restoration. They tried to change the elements into what they considered to be traditional, to squeeze the building into an older tradition. To this end, they left the walls unplastered. They tried to add casements to the windows and left the shutters only stained, not painted. They also removed the lighting fixture and nailed all round modern lighting fixtures. Other interventions in this same spirit were imposed in the interior as well as the atmospheric garden behind with its old fig trees. The result is decidedly ambiguous. Apart from Oninvasia, the cases are many of buildings where the good intention to save them turns them, into, turns them at the end to simulacra. This might, be, this might be caused by an unclear interpretation of the conception of, of safeguard, conservation, restoration. It might be that the old structure is used as a tool to flatter the vanity of the architect who thinks that being the creator, he can treat the past as he will. It might be that old buildings are treated as objects of decoration, as a nice rock or a tree are incorporated in a project. This is the case, we think, of the church which was left in the middle of the development in the Barbican. There are two similar cases in Athens. One little church which has been incorporated and in and dwarfed by the concrete columns of the building of the Ministry of Education. And another sunk between the unfriendly constructions of the central coach station. There are cases that vanity takes the form of imposing theories which sound so interesting as words. But architecture is not words. I would like to quote an extract in translation from the text which accompanied the proposal of a team of architects for interventions on the old Venetian arsenal in Heraklion, Crete. Open inverted commas. We avoided forms of the past which are normally legitimized by the facility of the leg legibility. Close inverted commas, etc. Is it only my idea that these words mean nothing? That they can legitimize any sort of intervention? That they seem to originate from some theoretical texts which are currently fashionable? In many cases nowadays, the purpose of an old building is reduced to creating interesting reflections on the glass surfaces of the oversized volumes of new complexes or of, of offices. The values of the old building become unimportant. It is there to add color and texture to the cold glass surfaces. This was the fate of an old historic house opposite the University of Athens. It was saved after years of struggle with the authorities and the developers. When finally the threat of demolition was avoided, restoration works took place by which the style was falsified the characteristics change, elements of different periods were mixed with the existing. For unknown reasons, it was forced to become a different mock historic building. And the only and the real purpose for its safeguard is the reflection on the surface of glass which surrounds it. 
a vague and re unreal resemblance of mock appearance, as one of the definitions of a simulacrum puts it. All the examples analyzed above made it clear that restoration may take undesirable forms, even within a framework of strict rules and laws, and reflects a varying approach and interpretation of the past. This leads to a few central questions. What does, not, what does one expect from an old building? What is the purpose of conservation? And to what extent is it important to preserve? And is it legitimate to intervene? What is the point after which an old venerated building is turned into a simulacrum? Our experience in Monenvalsia had led us to, be, to, be, to the belief that one should, be, should very carefully seek for the clear common characteristics which survived through many centuries and continue to be used. Each topos has its own indications of types, which have developed through the centuries, of elements of all sorts and of their mixtures, additions, or demolitions, their phases. The reality of the houses can be understood not by piling rubble, by pulling down the older remains, by carefully clearing the building from the earth which covers their truth, and trying to understand what happened. Everywhere the past is present, and we believe it should be kept with great care. The surface of walls contains evidence which is precious. Every change, every addition, every renovation is recorded along with the consistency of tradition. The aim is to concentrate on the old building itself and not to use it as a, pretext, as a pretext, as a means to pass other messages, as a personal interpretation of the past, reflecting imagined imagine conditions which are implemented with the equivalence of makeup and cosmetic, cosmetic surgery, a manipulation of the remains so as to show what the user, planners, owners, any social milieu would have wished to exhibit. It is clear how important is education. Education not only of the public, which is reflected in what is expected from the architects, but very specifically also education of the architects, which at this moment internationally is strongly despised histori despising historical studies and is revolving around theory and technology and large scale. It is hard, but it is possible to substitute a tradition of bad habits by tradition, respecting tradition. It was a great relief to attest that this could and has been achieved in Monenvasia, but that's another story. Thank you. I would like to thank also Mrs. Richardson for her reading. And also, it is a pity that Mrs. Caligas, she is not here with us because she has some very uh, interesting pictures, usually, when she presents these topics. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, these pictures would have been a very important illustration for all of us. Uh, of course, you should know also, I would like to add something here, that uh, Mr. and Mrs. Caligas, it's more than 30 years than they are working, actually, on uh, Monenvasia. So this kind of... Uh, thought or if you like these points uh, should be considered with this time framework which I, I think also makes it more important mm -hmm. and I think she touches the issue of uh, uh, what we call often in Greece uh, today the neo-traditional sort of style which is uh, nothing else but a simulacra and uh, actually it is also sometimes approved by committees, state committees which should control aesthetic quality in a building and these committees actually they do nothing else uh, than uh, to uh, uh, accept uh, new traditional, so to speak, styles, Byzantine or neoclassical or whatsoever. And uh, she touches the issue that I think we, we've been discussing th since this morning. And I think the most interesting question to keep in our mind is uh, while or when restoring, uh, what is the original? And I think this brings us immediately to the second speech by Mr. Ian Bristow, Mr. Bristow, as you know very well, I don't need to say that, he is the academic coordinator of the postgraduate course in building conservation in this school, and uh, I remember him since the beginning of the 80s. Actually, this is happening since 1982, isn't it? And he's going actually to continue, uh, I, I think so, uh, with a very provocative title, as far as I'm concerned, which is the restoration of Johnson's original colors in the breakfast room at Pitchhanger Manor. Please, Mr. Bristow. Thank you very much. 
Could I first of all apologize that I've been carrying a cough around with me for the last three weeks, and um, I'm trying very hard to get rid of it, but it just won't leave me. Um, before speaking about the subject of John Soane's breakfast room at Pittshanger Manor, I'd like to say, first of all, how pleased those of us involved with the postgraduate course on the conservation of historic buildings here at the Architectural Association are to welcome you, Eleftherios, and also, I'm glad to say, a, a fair sprinkling of our alumni, um, people who have successfully completed the course and um, gained the AA Diploma in Building Conservation. For those of you who are unfamiliar with our activities, the course was founded in 1975 and operates on a day-release basis, meeting on Fridays in term time. I've been academic coordinator, as has been said, since uh, 1982. Uh, my colleague, uh, John Redmill, um, who runs the second year, is already known to you through the paper that he uh, gave this morning. And uh, Dr. Sue Blundell and Alan Greening are at the back. I don't know whether you just care to stand up and um, wave or something so that everybody knows who they are. And you've, you've now met virtually the whole, the whole uh, team. All of us are part-time and in mesh are AA posts here with our own practices and academic work. I've put some of the uh, blue brochures about the course on the chairs um, uh, for you to read if you're interested and would like to stress that in running the course over the years we've always prided ourselves on our international links. John Redmill, as you will have realized, lives and practices in Ireland and flies to London weekly. In recent years, Sue, a noted classical scholar, has organized study visits to Italy, and I myself have lectured and consulted extensively abroad, most recently in Australia. As an architect, a title I may add given legal protection in the United Kingdom, I have always specialized in the conservation of historic buildings, but for many years have made my particular subject uh, the investigation and reconstruction of historic color schemes. To this, I believe, I have brought two particular contributions. The assembly of objective information about historic painting techniques and the aesthetics of the use of color, and the optimum use of optical microscopy in the investigation of particular color schemes. Today, I'm going to speak about an especially significant project, the recreation of John Soane's color scheme in his breakfast room at Pitsanger Manor in the London borough of Ealing, about eight miles west of where we're sitting uh, this afternoon. John Soane is a figure occupying a position of particular importance in the history of neoclassical architecture in England. His work straddles the all-important watershed of 1790 to 1815, which saw an immense revolution in taste in the decoration of interiors. And the breakfast room at Pitsanger Manor dating from the opening of the 19th century, is a seminal example of the new thinking. Soane was born in 1753 and rose to prominence as an architect in the 1780s. At the age of 15, he'd been apprenticed to George Dance the Younger, a man himself, then only 27, who had returned from a period of six years' study in Italy in 1764. While with dance, and if we could have the first uh, two slides, please. Thank you. <clears throat> While with dance, no doubt little realizing that he would eventually come to purchase the building for his own use, Soane had been involved in the design of a new wing added to Pitt's hangar, comprising a dining room on the ground floor and drawing room on the first. Paint samples have shown that these were decorated with white mouldings and ornaments in the conventional British manner of the second half of the 18th century. The ceiling in the drawing room, for instance, which I show on the uh, left-hand screen, um, having the grounds picked in with blue, green, and right in the centre, a touch of dark red. Uh, the slide on the right-hand screen is the uh, elevation by dance, uh, which goes... Um, with the, the um, ceiling. Although Stone left dance in 1772 to work for Henry Holland, remaining in the latter's office until 1778, the two men, as I think is fairly well known, remained closely in touch, especially after Stone's own visit to Italy 
in 1778 to 80. Traveling south, the 25-year-old Soame passed through Paris and visited both Rome and Naples. From the latter centers, he had the opportunity to see the remains of antique decoration at first hand, being notably in Rome during excavation of the house found in the grounds of the Villa Negroni, the influence of whose decorated walls uh, you will see in a moment. You see the uh, house being excavated in the uh, painting on the far screen. While at Pompeii, as he later recorded, he made clandestine drawings of the Temple of Isis, which had been unearthed in 1765. Curiously, what he saw in Italy does not seem immediately to have had an effect on his use of color. And he continued to use the established 18th century convention of a white architectural framework, picked in with tinted grounds. Extraordinarily, as far as can be seen, he did not even use any of the colored arabesque beloved of Robert Adam. Thus, the design which he made in Italy in 1778 for Frederick Augustus Harvey, Bishop of Derry, and from the following year, also 4th Earl of Bristol, for a summer dining room for Down Hill, the Earl Bishop's house on the Derry coast, shows a perfectly standard scheme of the period. You can see there all the joinery, architectural mouldings and so on is white, and the uh, color is simply the green um, added to the ground of the walls. While even after his precipitate return to Britain in 1780 at the Earl Bishop's behest, he seems for the first decade of his practice to have continued to work in this style, as evidenced by his drawings for such houses as Tendring, 1784, Blunston, 1785, Shotsham, also 1785, and Letton, uh, 1785 to 8. And I, I show here one of the elevations for the dining room at Letton um, on the near screen. Again, you can see this white architectural framework. It's simply the grounds of the walls and the panels which are picked in with green and pink. A significant change appears, however, in the house he designed for himself in 1792 to 4 at number 12 Lincoln's Inn Fields, um, about half a mile that away. Following his appointment as architect to the Bank of England in 1788, and a substantial inheritance from his wife's uncle in 1790. In the dining room, he abandoned the normal white on the joinery <coughs> in favor of graining. Uh, you can see on the, the dado, I've, I've just washed it in a, a sort of off-white color on my reconstruction drawing. While the walls were painted a deep red to which today we may instantly attach the label of Pompeian. The staircase, too, was decorated in an extraordinary way, using an effect reminiscent of the sooty stucco familiar to travelers visiting subterranean monuments in Italy, most notably, of course, the remains of Herculaneum. This is my uh, reconstruction of that sort of sooty uh, effect um, which he employed in the uh, hall and stairs on the near screen. Such effects quickly appeared in his work for clients, but further development of his style seems to have been dependent on his next essay in domestic work on his own account. In 1800, he purchased Pitzhanger Manor and rebuilt the main block as a villa for himself, leaving intact only the extension on which he'd been involved when apprenticed 20-odd uh, years earlier to George Dance. Um, Soane's new breakfast room uh, on the right-hand screen, lies to the right of the hall on entering. Um, I show the, the main front of the house uh, um, here on the near screen. You go in the, the front door in the center and it's, it's the room to the right. And when the house was sold in 1832, the room was described as, and I quote, originally called the marble room, the walls and ceiling in imitation of various sorts of marble. The design of the room clearly cost Soane a great deal of trouble, and several sketches and drawings survive at the Soane Museum uh, in Lincoln's Inn Fields. The house and collections within it, which he bequeathed to the nation on his death in 1837. Amongst these is this perspective, dated May 1802, 
which is different in certain details from the room as executed, and which gives little hint of the colours he was intending, apart from a dark plinth or skirting running around the base of the walls. A later drawing, which is dated 4th of August the same year, on the other hand, shows the walls flanking the door to the library divided into panels and has on it a number of manuscript annotations concerning colour. The source for both was clearly the elevation of one of the rooms discovered and excavated at the Villa Negroni in 1777, shortly before Soane's visit to the city. The link with the fret motif needs no elaboration. Uh, you can see this curious uh, fret here at the top, which reappears in Soane's design uh, around the panels. Um, while the correspondence of some of the colours is also notable. On his design, Soane proposed that the skirting should be porphyry or black. I think you can just see this uh, uh, note there, it says porphyry. Whilst the ground of the walls above is keyed to a note on the margin of the drawing, dark blue and the fillet lighter. The centre panel is labelled red, and the attenuated panel between it and the doors yellow. You can just see that, I hope, written up uh, sideways there. While the segmental area above the doors uh, was to be dark brown. Now, unfortunately, this colour scheme only partially relates to a highly finished perspective, uh, which appears to show the room as executed, the dark plinth here being replaced by a pale blue, and no red appearing on the walls. Even as late as the 17th of October, 1802, however, Soane still noted his intention for the plinth to be porphyry, although he now intended what he called the spandrels to be painted in imitation of rosewood. The caryatids standing in the corners of the room were to be copper bronze, and their plinths, capitals, and surmounting arch were to be marble. The oculus in the middle of the ceiling was to be painted with light clouds, while the flying figures on the ceiling were to be silver bronze. The last, the only of these embellishments, to be seen in the perspective. For the architectural historian, the documentary evidence, even when viewed chronologically, was therefore very inconclusive. And to further my research, in 1976, I took a series of cross-sections from the room. As is always essential, the locations from which they were removed were carefully plotted on a measured drawing. By examining these under the microscope, I was eventually able to produce an elevation showing the disposition of colour finally adopted by Soane. <coughs> the plinth, as you can see, was indeed porphyry. Um, and here is one of my uh, mounted cross-sections um, from it, from uh, one of these areas down here, um, showing the, the white preparatory coats, the dark red forming the ground of the porphyry imitation, and very luckily, even one of the white spots of paint which had been spattered over the surface to produce the effect of that um, uh, stone. And then this uh, layer of varnish um, on the surface, which of course appears on cross-section as, as a dark brown. You're looking at it down into a sort of dark transparent chasm uh, in the paint layers. And then above, the um, successive uh, colour schemes um, applied to the room during the course of the 18th sorry, during the course of the remainder of the 19th and the present centuries. The blocks against which the caryatids uh, stand uh, were black. The caryatids themselves were bronzed. Uh, you can see here the um, uh, substrate undercoats and then this layer of dark green with this bronze powder sprinkled onto the surface of the paint and again, traces of the original uh, layer of varnish um, on the surface. Uh, the same treatment was shared by the fret of the ceiling, while the flying figures and associated pattery uh, were figured. It's a sample from one of these flying figures here. You can see the, the grey undercoat here, and then the silver leaf um, on the um, surface of that. 
The oculus um, was pale blue, um, uh, um, which you see here. Whether this represents a, a large gray cloud or not, I'm not sure, but um, I just sort of hinted at a, a, a bit of a cloud. Um, somebody was referring earlier to the lack of sunshine that we get in this country. Um, and on the walls, uh, two different types of marble had been used. Within about nine inches of the margin of the walls, this was a bluish gray. Uh, you see here the buildup of the marble, the undercoats, layer of gray, layer of blue gray on top, layer of varnish above that. Uh, whilst inside this nine inch band uh, was a layer of green. Uh, you see here this dark um, green marble here with a layer of varnish on the surface. Now, at this stage, of course, looking simply at cross sections, it was impossible to go further without exposing sizable areas of imitation. And it was still unclear whether the fret at first intended by Sohn had been executed. Since the building was in use as library offices, I was unable to carry my research further. But I think you'll see that even cross sections on their own had gone a long way to elucidating the questions posed by the documents. Ten years later, however, I was appointed by Ealing Borough Council to act as consultant for the restoration of Soane's scheme in the room, and I was immediately able to arrange for small areas of the original paintwork to be exposed. To carry out this investigation, a firm specialising in the conservation of large-scale mural and other paintings was commissioned. Since I was anxious not only to ascertain the actual appearance of the various marbles and other finishes, but also to evaluate their condition and the feasibility of exposing the original surface rather than repainting. And I'm now going to show you on this screen uh, that area of paintwork there, just to the left of the um, entrance doors. This is the top of the um, plinth here, and this is the left-hand architrave of those doors. Unhappily, as you can see, the overpaint proved so resistant to solvents and so strongly adhesive to the varnish and marbling beneath that it was immediately clear substantial damage would be caused by its exposure. Uh, indeed, the surface of the um, uh, varnish had crocodiled and this extremely tenacious paint had run into the cracks um, and any solvent that would remove the overpaint uh, went straight through the overpaint and straight through the varnish and into the, the uh, glazes used uh, for the imitations. And so accordingly, it was decided to leave the, the, the originals undisturbed, the original uh, scheme of decoration undisturbed, and repaint the whole room above it, or at least above the overpaint, on the basis of sample areas. In particular, though, it was found that the fret proposed by Sohn had not been used, and the junctions between the marbles on the walls had been formed by a line of black. You can see here this blue-gray Bardilio marble here, the uh, verde antico panel in the center, and then this two-inch wide line of black. And most interestingly, the imitation had been completed by incising back through the, over, through the, um, the imitation back to the plaster to produce the effect of a joint between the uh, slabs of marble. Once the normal preparatory work and undercoating had been carried out by the general painting contractor working on other rooms in the building, a specialist firm of decorative painters employed for the, was employed for the marbling and other effects. The result, as you can see, was a complete transformation of the room. In place of, sorry, wrong one. In place of municipal gloss paint, the whole has gained a nobility and intensity seen particularly in the caryatids and the piers against which they stand. The flying figures on the ceiling too gained a tremendous intensity. And altogether, I think this provides a good example of uh, the combination of technical methods of investigation with the examination of documentary evidence. With its direct Roman archaeological inspiration, 
the whole room can now be seen in its true character, taking its full place in the work of Soane and the neoclassical movement in early 19th century Europe. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bister, and just by hearing at this very uh, accurate uh, presentation of this work, one cannot but think that uh, perhaps the issue of restoration, the first thing while restoring is to reconstruct, and this is not only Mr. Bristol's, I think it was in most of the speeches who presented, let's say, historic examples, and to reconstruct, I mean to reconstruct the history of the building that we are going to intervene. I believe this reconstruction moment, it is a very important and crucial issue that has not been discussed at length. How do we reconstruct the history before acting? What does it mean actually to reconstruct? Is it possible to reconstruct in one sense or perhaps reconstruction has more than one versions? Perhaps one could think even of having a kind of uh, I think even legislatively speaking, it would have been a bad idea to introduce a moment uh, before actually restoring of discussing the reconstruction that the architects are making of the buildings in which they are going to restore. Perhaps this is something that we should keep in my mind. It, it just came up with uh, Mr. Bristol's uh, presentation and I will pass immediately to Mr. Lefterius Economou who is not only the organizer of this conference, as you may well know, he is also uh, the director of Foundation for uh, Hellenic Culture in Berlin, and also uh, he uh, manages the independent course on theory of conservation at the General Studies Program here at the Architectural Association. And uh, I don't even need to discuss his subject. You might very well understand what does it mean to go from tradition to interpretation to reality. Mr. Economo. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, could I start with the slides, please? Workers are putting a vast glass dome atop the old Reichstag building in Berlin and building a grand new legislative chamber beneath it to accommodate the Bundestag, Germany's post-war parliament. Foundations are being excavated for new headquarters of the Chancellery. The Brandenburg Gate fully refurbished after the semicircle of the wall around it uh, came down in 1990. Will be flanked by imposing new French and US embassies to replace those that stood there before World War II. The past grandeur of the Adlon Hotel is being replaced recaptured by this new building. This is the beginning of an article that James Jackson wrote with the title Destiny Berlin for Time magazine in September 30th, 1996. These building activities and many others are operations involving in one form or another changes in the historic center of Berlin. The gutting of the 19th century building of the Reichstag and its transformation into the parliament of the Federal Republic of Germany, the refurbishing of the Brandenburg Gate and the completion of the original 18th century layout of Pariser Platz, the recapturing of the past grandeur of the Adlon Hotel. These and many others are building operations that require political decision making and involve dealing with historic buildings or past urban traces. In the process of reunification, a number of highly publicized architectural competitions have been proclaimed. Most of, them are, most of them are located in the Mitte, the historic center of the city, which because of the wall has become the peripheral center of the divided city, and interestingly enough, they coincide with the focal points that have attracted the, attra the attention of architects, politicians, and planners since the very origins of the city. We can talk about the Schlossplatz. Sorry. We can talk about the Sosplatz, which is on the left-hand side. Um, 
the Spreebogen, the Pariser Platz, the Potsdamer Platz, Friedrichstrasse, and Alexanderplatz. For the past, sorry. For the past nine years, Berlin has been transformed into the city of Cranes, the biggest building site in Europe. It has witnessed a frenetic building activity accompanied by bo boats of architectural controversy. It is clear that the intensity of the debate about Berlin supersedes all expectations. It has also become clear that what some architects and administrators call debate is intended by others as a monologue, devoid of any attempt to open the discourse into issues that are still considered taboo. Referring to the current building activity, architects and critics alike use terms such as stylistic sterility, conformity, regimentation, control, lost opportunities. The current situation is at the same time impressive and disappointing. It is evident that the city, in its attempt to find its new identity, undergoes an unprecedented change. Change which has always to do with new interpretations of the existing reality. Most of the architectural competitions in the centers are being realized. The private investors at Potsdam Platz, Sony, Daimler-Benz, ABNB, to, just to mention a few, are erecting their megastructure headquarters. Several thousand square meters of floor space have always already been realized next to the enormous billboards advertising f future functions. Um, what I'm trying to do on the left-hand side, I'm giving you the situation as was before the war, um, after the uh, fall of the wall, and on the right-hand side, I'm, I'm giving you the situation the day before yesterday, as it were. We are still with um, Potsdam Platz. Um, the left-hand side, the, the left side picture is supposed to be a reconstruction of what Potsdam Platz will look in 2010. In Paris, the Platz, House Lieberman and House Sommer, in Kleikos' neoclassicist, neoclassicist lines, are now flanking the newly refurbished Brandenburg Gate. Under the shadow of the imposing Adlung Hotel, by Paczke and Klotz. The two embassies, Potsdam Parks, France, and more Rabble and Udel, USA, are to start next. They already finished Dresden Bank by von Gerken and Marg, and the building sites of Geris Deutsche Genossenschaft Bank and Kolov's office and apartment block for the Dresden Bank at the corner of Wilhelmstrasse. Finally, the Academy of Arts by Benish will be the last but not least uh, to complete the original urban form of the carré, following, of course, the directives of critical reconstruction. The question, the question is, does this stylistic pluralism, following the historic traces of the 18th century uh, square, constitute an answer to the problem of reinventing the historic center of Berlin, especially the Pariser Platz. South of Unten der Linden, which is that, the, indicate, the buildings indicated in red are the newly erected uh, buildings. Uh, all the rest is the old, um, the, the old buildings as, in fact, exist in uh, the street. South of Unter der Linden, in the northern end of Friedrichstrasse, the large commercial developments have already been functioning for some time now and are covered with colorful advertisements for the luxurious office and shopping spaces they have available. 
building works are still going on at the southern end of the street. Um, I meant to draw this comparison between the Berlin Trilogy, uh, Schinkel's um, Schauspiel House, flanked by the, the French and the German uh, dome, uh, next to um, Jean Nouvel's um, 205, uh, Quartier 205, um, uh, Pay's office um, 206, and Unger's 207. Um, now, building works are still going on at the southern end of the street around the former Checkpoint Charlie, where the American Center, which you see on the, on the right hand side, um, and the other commercial buildings are being developed. The question here is how the laws governing the reconstruction of the street, keeping its historical traces, um, suffice in order to recreate the spirit of the street. In other words, is history reconstructed by adhering to the original perspectives or even to the eve heights of the building in um, Friedrichstrasse. The former Place de Republique, which you see on the, on the left, uh, in front of Ualos Reichstag, is a major construction site. It will accommodate three tunnels for rail, connections with the nearby Lerter Bahnhof, underground and road respectively. The first indications of a metal dome structure have appeared on the gutted Reichstag building, transforming it in this way to the parliament building for the Federal Republic of Germany. What is happening to Reichstag it is not unique or particular to Berlin. In an attempt to pres preserve the traditional character of a building or complex of buildings, there have been a lot of experiments of maintaining the historical facades and readapting the interior volumes according to new needs. The Reichstag's four exterior facades are kept intact. The interior space has been redesigned to comply the contemporary needs of the government. The question is now, uh, is how authentic is such a building after an intervention on this scale? And is the symbolic aura of the building enough to excuse such intervention? And in this particular case, to what extent uh, is it desirable given the historical connotations of this particular building? Um, again, on the left-hand side, the vision of Berlin by Yade Garassisi, 2010. Uh, this is the Reichstag and the government um, quarters. The project by uh, Axel Schultes of the ribbon of government offices along the bend of the river. And a closer view of the Reichstag again in as it would look in 2010. Yet another argument arises at the Schlossplatz. Since the removal of the ephemeral Trump Day of the Royal Palace two years ago, and the demolition of the building of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, this is um, this has been an attempt to create some kind of discussion and sensibilize the people in Berlin about rebuilding uh, in style the Royal, ba the Royal Palace, uh, which was demolished in 1961 by the East German um, government. Um, no decision has been yet taken, but in the meantime, they are clearing the spaces around it. The first operation was the demolition of this 10 floors, enormous uh, building of the Minister of Foreign Affairs, done by the ex-GDR government. Um, there is a great emptiness, of course, now. Um, the square that you can see this is the place occupied by the um, royal palace before, uh, including, of course, the 
um, the space of the pe building of the people, the palace of the people, which is here. And that, of course, um, uh, more food for our discussion about political decision making um, instead of the royal um, palace, we have the palace of the people of the ex-GDR government. Um, naturally, uh, the latter, so that is the palace of the people, erected by the socialist government of the ex-GDR uh, to replace but both physically and mentally the royal palace, it, it will be the next in line of extravagant Berlin demolitions. Lately, there are some ex excavations of the foundation of the Royal Palace and occasionally the typical Berlin imbiss stand with carivores for the tourists. On the site of Schinkel's Alten Museum, works have been started uh, for the reconstruction in style of the Lust Gardens, the Royal Gardens, the reconstruction or al identique of Schinkel's Bau Academy, which you will see in a minute, and on the other side of the ca canal is un still unhold. Um, what is interesting to uh, see, in fact, is that um, the, um, the royal gardens, which are occupying the space in front of the <coughs> Alters Museum by Schinkel, were, as it were, in front of this enormous royal palace, as you can see, which, if you see in a later picture, um, it sits next to the cathedral, the um, Protestant Cathedral of Berlin and the Alters Museum here, which is the beginning of the museum islands which extend between the canal and the river Spre in, Berlin, in the center. But let us assume for a moment that the political decisions are taken, the demolitions are done, and the royal palace reconstructed one of its four facades al identique and the other three in a suitable style as decided. Uh, the Lust Garden and the Bau Academy reconstructed al, al identique and then of course what we will have is on the one side of the Unter der Linden we will have a complex of buildings centered on the Royal Palace which might be housing a university or the State Library or art, art halls or tourist information, or maybe all these functions together. Across it, Schinkel's neoclassical Altes Museum, flanked by the eclectic style of Raschdorf Cathedral, and adorned by the reconstructed Lust Garden. Schinkel's original idea for the site was simple, romantic, and very powerful. He saw the very center of the city as a stage where the political and ecclesi ecclesiastical powers represented in the iconography of the royal palace and the cathedral respectively, were complemented by the power of the arts represented in the severe classicism of the Altus Museum. The question is, what exactly do we create by reconstructing in style one or more buildings? In this case, do we reinvent history having the Baroque palace reconstructed in part or in total at the end of the millennium or do we create yet another simulacrum, a meaningless secondary reality that replaces the real? Are the democratic and, and disaggregated functions assigned to historic buildings enough to demand uh, their reconstruction in their original styles? And will be, what will be the advantage of the future capital of the Federal Ge Republic of Germany to have at its center quotations of buildings that existed in the past with functions which no longer exist today. There is no royal family in Germany. What has been lacking so far is a general comprehensive concept. Oh, this is the um, Bau Academy by Schinkel, which um, they have been discussing of reconstructing uh, in this style. Of course, the royal uh, palace and the square and the gardens as um, Yadagar as he saw it for 2010 again. This doesn't work. Next to um, the uh, ruin of the royal palace after the war. 
uh, it was definitely a political decision, its demolition by the government of GDR. What has been lacking so far is a general comprehensive concept placing these impressive, controversial projects into a greater urban context. The master plan for the center of Berlin, initiated by the Senator for Pla Urban Planning, presented in a first draft at the end of last year, cannot claim to make up for it. It is evident that reuniting the city as one urban structure implies, implies a rethinking and reorientation of some of its individual parts. In the 20th century alone, the matrix of Berlin has been determined by a succession of imperial nation, republic state, national socialist dictatorship, destruction during the war, followed by four decades of separation into two political systems. Despite the relative scarcity of remaining historical buildings, Berlin can be read like a palimpsest of a succession of ideologies and forms of state by the way in which they found expression in architecture. During the 40 years as a divided city, Berlin has been pumped by both political systems in an artificial uh, existence, its eastern and western parts functioning as paradigm for both the socialist and capitalist world. In the East prevailed the modern movement as interpreted by socialism. In the Western part, a state of anything goes between the modern and the postmodern. With reunifying the city West with reunification, the city West around Kudam is bound to lose its eminent status and that it has for, for it has acquired after 1945. In future, it will have to view itself in a healthy competition to the old historic center in the East, as had already been the case in the past when the two commercial centers <coughs> coexisted. So far, and in spite of the frenetic building activity at Friedrichstrasse, little of this can be felt. The city west offers, in fact, urban metropolitan life with a specific mix of housing, commerce, culture, and entertainment within an area which is which has largely preserved the 19th century road network and building substance. The historic center of Berlin, located in the eastern part, however, needs to be redefined as center for the capital of the Federal Republic. The remaining historic buildings of symbolic relevance to the capital and or the nation have, however, been robbed of their traditional function as well as their historical urban context. The historic center, after 40 years as symbolic core of the GDR, reflects the ideological claim of its state, made manifest with the vocabulary of modernity, mainly of the 50s and 60s. Multi-lane interurban freeways, massive and exaggerated accesses, and squares flanked by large-scale prefabricated housing or office blocks. Since the collapse of the wall, Berlin has experienced a lively and controversial public discussion on the city and its architecture, both in the media but also in the so-called Stadt Forum, established to give the citizens of Berlin a chance to discuss urban and architectural issues with experts. Yet, so far, there have been not um, a public debate on some of the most crucial and basic issues centering around the question of coming to terms with, one own of, with one's own past history, especially in a country such as Germany, whose history is characterized on the surface at least by abrupt breaks. And against this background, what are the parameters, the guiding lines for this urban transformation? How can two radically different urban models representing two different ideologies be integrated? How do you uh, conduct an architectural debate in a city like Berlin with only a few remaining significant historic buildings yet with a heavy historical burden? Who decides and on what basis of what criteria, what is to remain and be integrated, what is to be demolished and what will receive a new facade? The frequently quoted Berlin architectural dispute centering around Lampugnani and Libeskind largely ignores these issues. 
It focuses aesthetic questions of old vis-a-vis -vis new, of critical reconstruction vis-a-vis -vis creating reconstruction, and fails to address the central issue, what kind of city do we envisage at the turn of the 21st century? Up to the end of the war, Berlin was not only the capital of Germany, but also of Prussia, the largest state within Germany, the predominant political, economic, as well as military force. This dual function guaranteed the city exceptional financial and political resources. Today, Prussia does, not, does no longer exist as a political unit. Furthermore, the federal structure of contemporary Germany enhances the political, economic, and cultural strength of regional centers such as Frankfurt, Hamburg, and, or Munich. This radically changed political structure will be reflected also in the status of Berlin as German capital. Beyond the Berlin-specific issue, most of the issues raised in this context do apply in one form or another and in varying degrees to all European urban metropolitan centers and the end of the century. Thank you. concept for describing contemporary society and public life, and that we are also living in the last perhaps uh, 10 or 15 years, an age where we consume more than ever images. And uh, this consumption of images, something that many other people, uh, uh, philosophers and others, have been uh, uh, describing as a kind of over-densification of history. I mean, this is extremely topical when it comes to actual decisions for town planning, uh, city making, and of course all this incredible amount of uh, examples that we have seen happening in Berlin. And also one has to say that this is a matter to be discussed uh, within the academic uh, framework, but of course it is a matter that uh, has to do a lot with issue of cultural politics, uh, specifically for a city like Berlin. I don't need to go any further than that. Just to add uh, that uh, what kind of city for the 21st century can we envisage? That was the question left by Professor Economo. And also for whom? Because uh, I would like to say that it is very interesting to think that if the maintaining just a facade, as it happens in some of these cases, it is an issue that has to do with experiential uh, uh, living of certain people, uh, which means that if for somebody to walk in the city, just looking at certain facades, which have been completely restored and changed inside in terms of space, materials, etc., means something for their experience as citizens or city dwellers. This is not applied to everybody. There are other generations, perhaps, which have nothing to do, which do not even recognize this. So this is a very interesting issue when we think of these things. And we pass to Professor Amadeo Bellini, who uh, he is an architect, of course, He's a professor of uh, theory and history of restoration. Uh, he was in Venice before and now he is teaching since 1989 in uh, Milan, in the School of Architecture in Milan. He, he also has uh, founded a school uh, for specialization in the restoration of monuments within Milan Polytechnic. And he also is a founder and director of a specialistic magazine. Is it ICMA, ICMA? the magazine, the review? Tema, Tema, because I cannot re read it very well, which is dedicated to architectural restoration. Of course, he has been uh, uh, written a lot and extensively uh, lecturing, and also uh, he has been engaged in some uh, very important uh, restoration works. I think he's going to talk uh, for the economic problems of conservation, and as far as I'm told, he's going to, to, to deliver the essence of his written text uh, in Italian, and uh, I think that I'm going to offer you, uh, if I am able to do that, uh, a very condensed version in English. But, but please, if you know Italian, please do help me if I'm missing something, okay? 
La rivista si chiama Tema, Tema. Eh, puoi dirlo, ehm, il titolo spiega già il contenuto. Tempo, materia, architettura. The review is actually that he runs is called Tema and which explains also the content which is uh, time, uh, content, uh, uh, matter and architecture. Allora, io farò una sintesi del testo che voi avete di fronte perché ritengo che questo sia più produttivo per la discussione e che mi consenta di individuare solo i capisaldi del discorso che voglio fare mentre gli elementi secondari potranno essere, se vi interesseranno, esaminati successivamente. The major uh, themes uh, in a very condensed form of his written discourse. Allora, noi pensiamo alla conservazione e non al restauro, ma quando usiamo questo termine non intendiamo un significato generico, privilegiare il mantenimento degli edifici antichi rispetto a quelli nuovi, ma al senso pieno della parola, conservare la materia che rappresenta e ci comunica le realtà culturali del passato in ogni suo frammento, sempre e comunque contro ogni ricostruzione e rifacimento. So, uh, his first point is that uh, uh, they speak, uh, I assume they in the context of his own work, for conservation rather than uh, restoration. But conservation for them is not a generic sort of term. Eh? It is a term used in a kind of plain sense, uh, if you like, uh, and it has to do with conser conserving matter, whereas matter, one should think of matter as the means of uh, uh, offering uh, or giving through its conservation, I suppose, uh, the cultural history that has been producing this matter. So it's a very specific kind of notion of what conservation means against, if you like, as he said, of all kind of reconstructions which supposedly they go into a more fictional sense. Il restauro nasce nella nostra cultura solo nel secolo scorso, non esisteva in precedenza e si basa su una serie di proposizioni che sono legate alle filosofie dello storicismo che non hanno più una loro vita nel presente e quindi il restauro dovrebbe essere abbandonato come concetto. Eh, as you understand from uh, your Italian, it's a very polemical position because, of course, restauro or restoration, it is a term that we all know comes from uh, 19th century and uh, uh, as uh, Professor Bellini claims, it should be abandoned because simply it is linked with the philosophies uh, which brought up uh, the so-called historicism and uh, as, as, as such, it has nothing to do with his position, which of course is The conservation of the matter. Il restauro nasce in un'idea della storia come una continuità lineare, progressiva, che consentiva di individuare il vero e che consentiva di riconoscere quegli oggetti che consentono a loro volta di comprendere il significato progressivo della storia, i pochi elementi emergenti che però ci danno il valore della razionalità del progresso. Questa è una concezione della storia che noi non condividiamo più. Nessuno pensa di poter riconoscere la verità della storia, la totalità della storia e la continuità della storia. And of course, uh, you may well know that the idea of uh, the notion of restauro it is linked uh, to an idea of history, whereas history it is a kind of linear uh, development, a kind of linear continuity in terms of time. And, uh, uh, of course, in this linear development there are certain things uh, that uh, have more value than others, according to this notion, of course, uh, certain truths, let's say, uh, and, of course, there are certain objects which supposedly uh, document or express, if you like, this notion of rational development better than others. And as Professor Bellini says, we all very well know that there is not one truth uh, and uh, that, uh, therefore, we cannot claim or assume a, a position which uh, proposes to us a linear continuity based on this kind of rational philosophy because we all know that uh, all these questions have been strongly debated and discussed and counterposed today.
Allora, la storiografia moderna ci ha insegnato il valore dei documenti di cultura materiale e il valore relativo di ogni documento che ha importanza all'interno di una ricostruzione storiografica in funzione del punto di vista che noi assumiamo. Se io cambio il punto di vista, cambia l'importanza del documento. Mm. Okay. Uh, contemporary historiography has brought up two issues which are pertinent to uh, his position. One is uh, the, uh, that documents, and by documents you should uh, try to understand a, a very general notion of whatever can be deposed or given uh, in society as a document, which has this kind of uh, value, let's say. Documents which uh, document uh, what we could call a material culture. Material culture it's perhaps I should say something here, Mr. Professor Bellini. It is a notion which is uh, very much linked to the Italian debates and theories, not only to, to this Italian debate, but generally speaking, it is related to them, that uh, deals with the issues of culture and civilization for those who know a little more the discussion about all these terms. So by material culture, it is a specific uh, position. That's the first thing, documents of material culture, and then uh, uh, the relative uh, uh, value that a specific document might have within the framework of a given uh, time setting uh, point of view uh, within a, uh, at a certain moment in history or at a certain specific context, let's say. Allora, la storia vista in questo modo non mi dà degli strumenti per selezionare il passato. So Però this, uh, anche l'estetica non mi dà questi strumenti, sia perché essa è soggettiva sia perché noi e tutti i restauratori, quando parliamo di estetica, in realtà parliamo dell'opera d'arte come l'abbiamo concepita o come l'ha concepita la filosofia idealista, come una unità o una cosa eccezionale. E non si comprende più la possibilità di una fruizione estetica della frammentarietà, della irrazionalità. Il cosiddetto errore, e stamattina se ne è parlato molto, storicamente è un documento positivo come ciò che non consideriamo errore e ha lo stesso diritto di vivere. So, uh, history uh, in this sense uh, cannot be seen as a tool or as an instrument that would help us or guide us, if you like, in order to select from the past. And because as He just said before, history by definition, uh, it is a relative concept. And aesthetics also cannot be uh, considered as an instrument or as a tool uh, to deal with the past, uh, because as we know very well, it has to do with ideal, ideal, idealistic philosophy, and therefore it is subjected very much to the subject. And uh, so there is nothing that has a kind of unity or that could be exceptional. Uh, instead of that, His position claims uh, an aesthetic uh, reception or fruition, if you like, which is based on fragmentariness, on, on fragments, let's say, and of course on uh, irrationality rather than rationality. Therefore, when we often talk about something that was an error in the past, vis-à-vis -vis the notion that we have been discussing this morning, I believe in reference to the restoration of the, of the Acropolis uh, of, the, of the Parthenon in the 1930s, uh, there is nothing according to Professor Bellini, that could be considered as an error in that sense, not technically speaking, but historically or aesthetically speaking. Allora, la domanda che cosa conservare ha una risposta sola. Bisogna conservare tutto. Però non è possibile conservare tutto. E allora, siccome storia e estetica non ci danno degli strumenti, dobbiamo cercarli da un'altra parte. So, to the question, what should be conserved, uh, one uh, would answer immediately, I would like to conserve everything. But since this is not possible, and uh, since this is not even possible uh, by uh, being helped or guided uh, through history or through aesthetics, as I explained before, we have to look uh, in other domains uh, for uh, concepts, ideas, guidelines to do. Allora, per quanto riguarda la relatività storica, i nostri maestri ci sono, sono gli storici delle Annal, Riegel, Vorjak, ma il vero maestro per quanto riguarda
perché e come conservare Raskin. So, as far as uh, uh, historical relativity is concerned, or uh, the notion of relativity in history, uh, we know very well that there are, there are other historiographic schools of thought uh, and practice, of course, vis-a-vis -vis the school, the French school of the Annal, uh, basically, and of course, Alois Riegel. And uh, uh, what was the question at the end? Perché? Perché? The last, uh, l'ultima questione, perché? No, la questione era chi ci ha insegnato anche come conservare e perché era Askin, ah, poi but, lo spiego. But of course the person who instructed us uh, on how to conserve and why to conserve, uh, according to Professor Bellini, is uh, John Raskin. Allora, se noi superiamo gli schemi di giudizio storico ed estetico, dobbiamo e non possiamo fare altro che fare riferimento alle esigenze vitali dell'uomo e quindi alle scienze umane e all'antropologia. So one uh, field to tackle would be uh, those fields actually that deals with the basic needs uh, of uh, human beings and uh, therefore we can uh, talk about biology and anthropology. Ecco. Noi potremmo fare molti esempi di documenti che, che se conservassimo ci racconterebbero molto della storia, anche della nostra storia, ma che per ragioni umane non siamo in grado di conservare o perché non siamo capaci tecnicamente di conservarli, o perché sono molto invasivi, invadono il nostro spazio. We could tell a lot about documents, uh, or we could have documents that would tell us a lot about history, but uh, for different reasons we are not able to conserve them, otherwise we would have an, an incredible information about uh, our historical past. Noi dobbiamo riconoscere che distruggere è sempre una perdita, che dobbiamo conservare tutto ciò che è possibile conservare e che se ci poniamo in questa idea, e qui veniamo al problema economico, non è possibile pensare alla conservazione delle testimonianze materiali che sono legate a quelle spirituali attraverso un risparmio. La nostra economia si svolge su altri campi e mettiamo da parte del denaro per la conservazione. Raskin ci aveva spiegato che questo è impossibile e che l'economia deve essere organizzata per la conservazione. So to distract is always a loss. Uh, so we should conserve the possible. Uh, yet, when it comes to these terms, uh, to the conservation of the cultural documents, uh, we should think perhaps of the notion of economy, uh, and this is also a notion that uh, comes from uh, John Ruskin. In Italia è molto sviluppato un dibattito che si pone il problema economico dei beni culturali in questi termini cioè se la presenza di beni culturali può essere una risorsa dal punto di vista del flusso turistico, per esempio, delle occasioni di lavoro, delle possibilità di scambio. Ma questi concetti sono insufficienti. So, uh, when we are talking about this issue of economy and uh, about uh, the relationship of this issue to the notion of uh, Uh, cultural uh, products, beni culturali, or uh, yes, cultural products, which is a, a broad notion uh, to be applied to basically uh, most of the human production that uh, has been uh, considered as valuable or uh, interesting to maintain and to conserve, uh, then we come to the notion of how this uh, relationship between cultural products, uh, human artifacts if you like, Uh, and uh, economy is related to the current uh, notions uh, that have to do with uh, exchange and uh, touristic consumption and uh, so to speak with these uh, contemporary mani manifestations of public life. And uh, just these manifestations, they are not sufficient to describe uh, this relationship. Allora, se noi pensiamo all'economia come una scienza con una finalità di natura etica, di natura morale, 
e quindi è un'economia che mira al benessere della persona, noi dobbiamo anche comprendere che soddisfatti i bisogni primari, il fine dell'economia è quello di soddisfare i bisogni di natura immateriale, i bisogni culturali e spirituali. So, if we think of economy as a science that, that has a, a moral uh, dimension in it, of course, and that its scope being uh, that of uh, implying the well-being of, uh, of, of human nature, uh, then we come at, at the point, veniamo sul punto? Sì, allora. L'ultima frase. L'ultima frase? Sì. sì, che allora dobbiamo soddisfare beni di natura non materiale, quindi okay. non di scambio di prodotti. Exactly. So if we think of economy in this context, uh, then we come to the point that uh, when we talk about conserving uh, the cultural artifacts or cultural goods, uh, this uh, has to do more with the spiritual dimension uh, of these products or these artifacts and not specifically with their consumption. Allora il bene culturale non è bene economico in quanto lo si possa scambiare, ma è bene economico per eccellenza perché è già in se stesso un bene economico in quanto soddisfa il fine primario dell'economia. Obviously from this follows that the cultural artifact has a strong relationship with the notion of economy if economy is, has this moral dimension uh, in order to implement the well-being of human beings and uh, by that it is uh, an economic, uh, if you like, product or artifact uh, per excellence. Raskin si opponeva alla società meccanizzata perché separava il lavoro dalla espressione della personalità e certamente errava nel, nel pensare alla possibilità di un ritorno all'artigianato. Ma la nostra società post-industriale, che non ha più nessun problema nel produrre, anzi produce troppo, può arrivare a quanto Raskin richiedeva, cioè a togliere l'uomo dal lavoro alienato per considerare la massima parte del suo tempo applicata alla intellettualità, ai valori della cultura. And from this follows another uh, provocative argument that for Raskin, of course, Raskin was opposed, as we all may well know, to mechanization uh, because of the split that mechanization brought uh, to between uh, the product, the artifact, if you like, and the personality of its uh, creator, uh, which has to do a lot with the notion between craftsmanship and the uh, industrialized uh, process of uh, cultural artifacts. He believes, uh, Professor Bellini, that in our post-industrial society uh, there is the chance or the opportunity, if you like, to uh, detach uh, humans from so-called alienated labor and, uh, uh, in other words, that uh, humans will have more time dedicated to intellectual issues and uh, culture in a more broader sense. And that brings the topic of conservation within the heart of uh, our discussion. Già eh, l'economia moderna però si è orientata in questa direzione, non solo le economie più recenti che fanno riferimento appunto all'economia del benessere o della società del benessere o del benessere della persona, ma anche in illustri precedenti dell'economia inglese, quella keynesiana, quella di Beveridge, si riconosce al bene culturale un carattere che si chiamavano semi-economico, in parte oggetto di scambio, in parte invece di fruizione, e riconoscevano l'esigenza che la cultura pubblica garantisse che la fruizione non è proprio il capitolo della sua economia relativo ai This notion of economy, of course, has some uh, precedents, uh, quite notorious and famous. We can talk about uh, Keynes, and according to him, uh, in the chapter describing uh, the notion of uh, the human person, uh, there is, uh, he, he, he states that 
a cultural uh, product or artifact uh, is uh, a sign of uh, uh, that we could think in two uh, ways, a sign for fruition and a sign for exchange. And uh, he, he insisted on the double uh, no, uh, notion or character of this, of the sign of the cultural artifact vis-a-vis uh, -vis the notion, uh, it's been both intellectual and cultural sign and also economic uh, sign, which means also, that brings us back to the argument that uh, Professor Bellini is making since the beginning about this double nature of uh, the cultural artifacts, which has to do also with a specific understanding of uh, economy as a science. Ecco, questo pone alcuni problemi, perché la generalità delle persone riconosce un valore di ordine culturale e spirituale agli edifici eccezionali, ma non riconosce la grande qualità del territorio come insieme di segni storici che in effetti vengono continuamente distrutti anche quando non è necessario. Mancano delle capacità conoscitive e quindi sono d'accordo con chi stamattina ha detto, o anzi oggi pomeriggio, che è importante educare la gente ed educare soprattutto gli architetti e i pianificatori. Uh, we have a problem here after these uh, statements uh, because we should accept that uh, most of uh, human beings uh, they would uh, agree in uh, giving a spiritual uh, dimension or if you like in recognizing the spiritual dimension in buildings let's say or in some buildings at least uh, but they would not be ready to do so uh, when it comes to the notion of territory This is still another very important notion within the Italian debate, which means a territory be, being as something that we could call a kind of, uh, I use my own word, landscape preexistence, which is full of different sort of signs from landscaped elements, buildings, etc., etc. And this kind of notion is not so much uh, current. And so uh, Professor Bellini would, uh, be, uh, would agree I think it was uh, Mrs. Caligas in her paper who said that uh, uh, there is a need today to educate people, and he would add not only people, of course, but architects and town planners as well. Ecco, da questo punto di vista il vero problema è quello di trovare il limite che sarà variabile tra libertà delle persone e capacità di intervento pubblico. Ma il vero problema è che l'intervento pubblico sia corretto e capace. Scriveva proprio Keynes che si desiderava che avesse almeno l'intelligenza del privato nell'intervenire e nell'individuare programmi di grande respiro e non programmi di semplice emergenza. So, we come then to the next question, which is uh, uh, what would be uh, the, the limit, or if you like, the threshold, uh, which of course it is a very relative notion as well, uh, between uh, what we could accept as uh, uh, individual uh, liberty, uh, basically meaning that uh, I do whatever I want to do in my own house or whatever in terms of conserving, and uh, uh, between this and uh, the so-called public intervention in this sphere of conservation that we are talking. Again, Keynes is offering us here an interesting notion Uh, because he was uh, stating uh, that it would be enough for public uh, services uh, to have uh, the intelligence uh, of uh, individuals sometimes. And of course, the crucial notion here would be uh, not only uh, to, uh, to, to, to act, because usually uh, public uh, intervention happens when there is an emergency case, but uh, uh, to have also what we call uh, respiro, which basically is a kind of vision uh, and, uh, about uh, the things that we want to act upon. Forse però il problema più complesso è quello di riconvertire una economia che si fonda sul consumo e sull'espansione illimitata. Ci sono molte situazioni nelle quali non si pensa che un prodotto possa non essere più fabbricato. In Italia, per esempio, il numero di case è largamente superiore al fabbisogno e oggi si pensa a rivitalizzare l'industria edilizia 
attraverso programmi ampi di demolizione, cioè si riproduce sulla casa il meccanismo dei prodotti di consumo, buttare via per poter produrre. Il prodotto è diventato fine a se stesso e non più il mezzo per soddisfare il bisogno. Of course, the next or the following issue is uh, that one of uh, that we should probably think more uh, how to reconvert a certain economy uh, or economical process if you like, uh, which is based completely upon consumption and upon uh, limitless growth and expansion. And uh, Professor Bellini brings the example uh, in Italy, where apparently now, uh, because there is a kind of uh, uh, surplus of, uh, of building stock in terms of houses, more than the actual needs uh, in the country, there are programs of uh, demolition of this uh, uh, surplus uh, of uh, building stock. And of course, that means simply that the cultural artifact or product uh, should not uh, uh, be uh, thought in terms of uh, a an, end, an end for consumption, but also as a, a means to obtain something. Ecco. Non è necessario tuttavia aspettare o pensare che occorra comunque una riforma generale della nostra economia. È possibile fare molto anche all'interno degli attuali meccanismi economici e questo è possibile laddove si intervenga con i mezzi di natura fiscale, privilegiare le manutenzioni rispetto alle sostituzioni, privilegiare la manutenzione rispetto all'attesa speculativa, eliminare le rendite di plusvalore sui terreni, oppure, come avviene in molti paesi europei, non dare incentivi fiscali alle trasformazioni, comunque esse siano, come sta avvenendo in Italia in questo momento, ma finalizzandole a obiettivi di qualità progettuale. It follows from this that of course we are not going to change or to restructure completely or to reform if you like uh, the actual or the current or the ongoing economic economic processes. Uh, but of course that we could act within uh, the existing economic mechanisms. Uh, simply, or not so simply, but just by putting our emphasis or our attention uh, or, our pri or by just by privileging, if you like, uh, the notion of uh, maintenance uh, against or versus uh, substitution, uh, maintenance against, again against uh, speculation uh, and against uh, the profits that one would, uh, would make. Uh, look at the, uh, rendita fondiaria in English is the kind of profit that you have un profitto sui, sulla posizione dei terreni no, no, I, I, know, I, know, I know it but in English I, I'm missing the term <laughs> anyway it's the profit that you have uh, from, uh, from, the, from, from the land and, the, and uh, there's a specific term uh, for this uh, so? speculation. speculation okay speculation you got it and uh, uh, that also means uh, that uh, one could act uh, on, uh, uh, on the actual laws, if you like, or the incentives that one gives for fiscal uh, reasons uh, when uh, all these operations are, uh, are, are, are thrown in, into our table. Allora, in questo quadro, tutto ciò che sussiste fa parte di ciò che si chiama il nostro destino, ciò a cui non possiamo sfuggire, ma rappresenta la nostra risorsa per progettare il futuro. E qui c'è una concezione della storia in cui il passato è da un lato il limite ed è la realtà dentro la quale noi ci muoviamo, ma d'altro lato è l'insieme delle nostre possibilità e libertà per il futuro. Diceva sempre Raskin che il vero progressista è il più grande conservatore perché si trascina dietro tutto il passato. E diceva Oscar Wilde che il passato è l'unica cosa che nessuna ricrezza può comprare. Mm. I need to come back to it. So, therefore we'll talk about uh, the, one of the last issues is the notion of destiny, of course, our destiny. 
or uh, otherwise, if you like, since we're all architects, uh, uh, on how to project our future. And then we come to the notion of history again, which is uh, uh, a notion of history where past, uh, it is a limit, it is a reality, uh, it is a given as a limit and as a reality, but it is also the ensemble uh, of uh, all our possibilities. And this is a very interesting notion. He refers again to John Ruskin, who would say apparently that uh, the real uh, progressive uh, character would be the one which is also, uh, uh, how should I call it, a conservative character. So that he would play on this paradoxical notion that the true, the truth, uh, the true uh, progressist, uh, progressivist is the conservative, which is an interesting paradox. And then Oscar Wilde. Nessuna ricchezza può comprare il passato. That would say that uh, there is no uh, richness that uh, would be able to buy the past. So there is no possibility to just to buy the past uh, uh, because we think that our society, this is a very kind of naive uh, translation of Oscar Wilde, uh, because we think that we can buy the past, because we have the means to buy the past. Allora, in questo quadro non serve nessuna carta del restauro. Nessuna teoria del restauro, al più possono servire norme per la qualità del progetto, strumenti per, approfond per approfondire la complessità dei problemi e le interrelazioni tra le cose e per esplorare il campo delle possibilità tecnologiche. La conservazione non ha una teoria ma ha dei metodi di procedura in rapporto alle circostanze. In this sense you can easily understand that uh, any kind of discussion or debate about uh, a, a charter uh, of, of restoration or for restoration uh, has no sense uh, or even a kind of theory of restoration has no chance for according to Professor Bellini. Uh, the only thing that one could uh, claim are norms, if you like, rules, uh, which uh, would govern uh, the quality of, of our design when it comes to these terms. And uh, uh, that simply means, uh, I lost, ho perduto l'ultimo, conservare? L'ultima... La conservazione? No, un occorrono processo. appunto strumenti ah, per... La, yes, per okay, la... I found it. That the conservation has no, is uh, theoryless, let's say. The notion of conservation, therefore, as he claims it is uh, theoryless, uh, because it is a process uh, which, is, which goes on, uh, a process which also has a very circumstantial sort of definition, uh, casus per caso. Sì, caso per caso, ma avendo, eh, è diverso, cioè c'è un obiettivo in rispetto alle circostanze. E voglio chiudere, terminare, eh, ris mh, rispondendo quasi a un'obiezione che viene fatta molto spesso dagli architetti, che una teoria della conservazione limita il loro campo di creatività. Questo è completamente falso perché una teoria della conservazione che esclude la ricostruzione lascia campo agli architetti per il nuovo, dove il vecchio non si può più conservare perché non risponde più a esigenze di vita e nella giunta moderna al vecchio che è quanto si deve fare piuttosto che falsificare stilisticamente attraverso la copia che, come ha già spiegato qualcun altro, non ha nessun valore di verità e di cultura. Therefore, uh, you understand very well that uh, there is an objection that may be raised and some architects actually do raise it. Uh, that conservation in these terms uh, that Professor Bellini uh, offers to us uh, brings uh, limitation uh, uh, in the so-called creativity of the architect. Uh, he believes that this is a, f a false problem uh, because at the moment that we don't have a reconstruction, which is really the false issue here, uh, we are open, we are, we are left with uh, two possibilities, if you like, and that's uh, the kind of last uh, summary. Uh, either to do something new, uh, when exactly the old uh, cannot be maintained anymore or conserved anymore, therefore, 
you know, to do something new, it's just to be faced with the issue of creation, so to speak, or creativity, in other words, or uh, how to uh, join or to relate, uh, that's my word, the, uh, the new with the old, which is a very important subject, and uh, this goes against any kind of falsification or reconstruction that brings the notion of the copy, and so on and so forth. Grazie. Mi Thank scuso per il tempo. Ok. I'm not going to give any comments on this presentation. I think I already did that. And uh, I think there is a very interesting uh, theoretical framework that we can take on, uh, on our discussion later. And now we will pass in the last presentation of this session, which is going to be given by Rory Young. And uh, Mr. Young, as far as I see here, he has been uh, dealing, uh, he has a practical interest in traditional building. Uh, after graduating in painting and sculpture, he has been uh, traveling uh, in the north of the country, uh, investigating and studying architecture, artifacts, building, and landscape. And he has been commissioned to design several uh, uh, and I think that he is going uh, to uh, present to us uh, one of his uh, latest commissions, which is uh, the design of 16 prototype sculptures to illustrate the new Genesis cycle for the Great West Doorway of York Minster. Is that so? That's right. Thank you. Well, it's very good to be here. It's a great uh, privilege to be sc speaking among such other illustrious speakers. Um, you've missed out a paragraph there. <laughs> And it consists of, I suppose, about 15 years of um, work in the conservation field, working with lime mortars and plasters. And that's been in the, involved in conserving buildings per se, um, stonework in particular, and plasters in particular. And having worked for an architect doing a strictly conservation project in um, Scotland, that, that architect became... Uh, he became the surveyor of York Minster, and uh, he proposed me, uh, in fact his wife proposed me, to enter a competition uh, to actually design new sculptures for the new Great West Door. Um, I shall explain, you will see it in a second. But it's an extraordinary irony that I should have been working in uh, the conservation field, and I should find myself winning a competition that plunged me uh, into the forefront of a very controversial restoration project. Uh, this is uh, the restoration. Is the, the basically, it's in, it's it's it involves the uh, the removal. So you could really say the destruction of a medieval uh, Great West door on one of our cathedrals, a complete arch. Um, and I, all the time that I was involved in this project, uh, I was. Uh, dreading the, the sort of the ghosts of William Morris and Ruskin and the whole of the SPAB forefathers. On the other hand, what's interesting is that I, I began to feel what it must have been like for William Morris because he was at once a conservator and he was an artist. He was very creative and yet he had this reverence for old buildings, uh, for the art of the past and past craftsmen. And... Uh, at once he was making new things, and at once he was, cru uh, he was uh, venerating and repairing and conserving uh, old things. And in order to uh, get involved in a very creative way with York Minster and actually begin to feel what that building was all about, it meant the removal of in situ medieval fabric. So there's a, a lot of paradoxes, and I think a lot of things which we might... Uh, you might be interested to discuss afterwards. But that's all I'm going to say about the general philosophy. Um, I'm just going to go straight into what I did for the building. And it was a very small part. The most of the work has been done by the uh, York Minster carvers who have actually carved the stones. I was just involved in designing the um, just 16 stones out of about 150 stones that have been carved. Okay, so should we start? Oh, sorry, I'll go back. I can turn these off. Actually. That's it. Does that turn off? Doesn't matter, that's all right. 
Um, well, the, what we're talking about is this doorway here, quite a small part of the whole West Front. And my stones involved a very small part of the, uh, of the arch of that. So we're talking about a microcosm, microcosm of this huge, great uh, macrocosm. And it's fascinating to have been involved in such fine detail on such a huge uh, building. I'm sorry, go forward, that's it. Um, here is the, the archway, and uh, the order I was involved with is this central order here. There's one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, five of these orders are being, uh, sorry, four of them are being replaced. Um, I, initially, when I saw the doorway, I felt that it was uh, perfectly worthy of conservation. To me, it would have been a wonderful challenge and a very creative challenge to conserve this doorway. It would involved uh, a certain replacement of the most decayed stones, um, a lot of mortar repairs, and a lot of uh, protection with lime shelter coats and so on. But uh, we live in a pluralist, pluralist society. Uh, at once we have Salisbury Cathedral, which has got a very strict conservation policy. They're using no cement very limited amount of new stone, uh, and it's very much uh, conservation uh, as in the Charter of Venice or the Borough Charter. Um, here at York, quite different. It's very much the, um, you could say it fits into the Victorian tradition of restoration. And having got involved with this project, there is a validity about it. And just before I got involved with this, I went on a conservation mission to Thailand, where Buddhist temples, Buddhist religious buildings, if they're not being used, they're considered worthless. So the whole notion of conservation is new to them. The idea of preserving a Buddhist temple purely for its inherent uh, beauty because of the interest of its fabric, uh, that hitherto has been an irrelevance. Uh, if it's not up and running as a religious building, it's then uh, worthless. It can then be allowed to, de to decay. And of course, all through the centuries, um, our great religious buildings have been like icons, um, image screens. Um, and if the image has fa failed by deterioration, you cut it away and put in a new image, which will read clearly to the uh, worshipper, to the visitor, the pilgrim. And so that's the other way of looking at it. And, you know, people say uh, in the living church that us conservators are getting in the way of the building uh, being a religious building, uh, having a religious function. Well, I don't agree. I believe you can conserve, you can be very creative. All the things can go on at once. But in this particular instance, we're talking about uh, restoration. So the doorway consists of fabulously intricate detail. Most of it's foliage ornament, but within it, there is this one order of figurative scenes. And even those are fairly diluted, rather like a necklace where you have um, alternating beads uh, of different texture. You have the open texture of the figurative scenes. Um, either side, there is a very dense texture of a canopied, uh, a, a, a niche head, a canopy. And these stones uh, stand an imperial one foot and an eighth inches high. I can't remember how many millimeters that is, but they're very small. They are literally that big. And what we're looking at here is a severely decayed um, 19th century, early 19th century uh, recreation. So here we have the proposed restoration of at the lower parts of the arch an existing restoration. Higher up, it was fairly conjectural what was medieval and what was replacement, but higher up in the crown of the arch, it was pretty well sure, we were sure that... that, that the sculptures were medieval. So here is uh, uh, an interesting example of a, um, uh, 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 an English Regency mason's view of a 1340s sculpture, English decorated, uh, seen through the eyes of somebody living in the English uh, Regency period, 19, uh, sorry, 1819, that sort of time. Uh, and it's, it's fascinating how how different it is to how we would see medieval sculpture today. Subtle nuances. 
Well, I was asked to enter a competition. Um, I found I uh, was, was being pressurized into entering it. I don't know why, but I, I did think, well, why not? Be interesting just to have been involved. But I found myself um, being chosen. I think one of the reasons I was chosen was probably not because of these images, but because of my approach, which was uh, essentially practical. Uh, these drawings were done from clay models, um, so I could get the light falling from the correct angle, so I could get the, the chiaroscuro uh, falling across these, these forms. Uh, incidentally, these landscape uh, views, I changed this idea completely when I came to doing those two scenes, but this one, uh, the elements of it largely survived into the final um, design. Well, in order to make a, um, uh, a one to one scale uh, uh, model in clay, uh, I decided actually the clay would be better in plaster for the outer molding. So I simulated the outer molding in, in plaster. Uh, so, first of all, I had to get the templates, the bed mold, which I got. Uh, made in metal from the stone yard at York, sent down to me, and I measured and looked, and then I realized I had to get the radius right. So here we can see uh, the a cornice being made, the typical uh, fibrous plasterwork process, uh, building up a cornice. Here we have the section uh, layer by layer. Uh, on the curved, of the curve, of course, corresponding to the third order, the actual arc. Um, uh, so these were sliced up into one foot high lengths and uh, cast in little uh, trays to simulate the stone uh, feature. And the other, uh, one of the other um, exigencies I had, one of the uh, architectural constraints, which I actually liked, I enjoyed the the fact that this was sculpture very much in an architectural context, it is actually deep relief. Uh, one was able to get r remarkably illusionistic, um, but nevertheless, it was always relief. Usually, it's flat relief on a panel. Here, it was relief within this great cavetto molding. Um, and, of course, it had to conform to uh, the masons, uh, the, the mass, the, the outline uh, given to the carvers by the masons. So this profile here is slightly wider than this profile here. And all the time I had to run this little cursor up and down to make sure that my uh, forms were within that line. So that when that was cast into plaster, the carvers could copy uh, my uh, prototype exactly. Uh, you know, everything that I made, they could then copy into stone. This is, as I say, very much a Victorian technique uh, and I wonder how much clay models were used uh, in the Renaissance period or in the Gothic period. I mean, did, uh, who knows, did um, Agostino di Duccio use clay models when he did those wonderful reliefs uh, in the Tempio of uh, Manuel Testiano in, in Rimini? I don't know. I've looked at these carvings. They feel very much like uh, carvings done by well, Eric Gill believed that clay was a dreadful uh, idea to, to work from a clay model, that you should conceive straight into the stone. I don't know about that. I felt very much that the carvers needed guidance. They wanted uh, the images to be fully resolved. And in order to do that, I had to actually manipulate them in clay. The other constraint was to get the curvilinear quality of um, a bit of decorated Gothic. The way the uh, figures flow, you get this wonderful um, uh, sinuous quality. And of course, they were to be conceived head to foot, running in a linear way. 